I don't think the microphone has ever been this low before in Whelan's. I'm Elizabeth, I'm a lecturer with the School of Inclusive and Special Education in Dublin City University and I am a first timer for Bright Club. <laughs> Easy for you to say. <laughs> so I have volunteered to go first tonight because I'm hoping that most of you here won't have that much experience of having an interpreter on stage and you'll be so mesmerised by Cormac's linguistic dexterity here that you won't pay any attention to the, at least the first half of my set. And if I feel like things are starting to kind of go downhill for me, I'll just throw in the odd swear word and you guys will be too busy trying to figure out what's the Irish sign language for shite or bollocks to be bothered paying any attention to me. So. <laughs> Just in case you missed that, shite and bollocks. <laughs> so, of course, my deaf friends are going to know that things have gone horribly wrong for me. So my deaf friends tonight, if you see that the amount of bad words starts to escalate in the set, just please laugh along heartily, supportingly, and don't tell the hearing people what's going on. OK, so I have to admit um, at the very beginning that this was a terrible <laughs> idea. Um, I am not naturally a funny person. I mean, like, I have brought cue cards to a comedy gig. I feel completely naked because there's no PowerPoint behind me. <laughs> um, comedy is just not a strong point for me. But fortunately, I come from a long and rich history of terrible ideas. Person, in a way, I kind of feel right at home. What do I mean by this? I am a hearing person and I work with deaf people and through the centuries there have been the most ludicrously bad ideas from hearing people, people like me, when it comes to what they think deaf people need or want or deserve in life. So in celebration of possibly my worst professional idea to date, I thought I would share some of these terrible ideas with you tonight. So bad idea number one. Hearing people are obsessed with trying to cure deaf people. Now, hold on to your socks, hearing people, because this may come as a shock that the deaf community aren't that bothered really about being cured. Most of my deaf friends, people who are here tonight, spell deaf with a capital D. So they're really proud of the fact that they're deaf, and if you gave them the chance to sort of magic away their deafness overnight, they're not going to take it. So hearing people, though, have persisted through the ages, and they've come up with some really ludicrous ways of trying to cure deafness from using peach kernels and twigs to boiling oil and a really unpleasant tradition of fracturing the skull behind the ear. Anyway, one of my personal favourites, not one that I'm going to recommend that you try out at home, is that the deaf person would boil their own urine and use the water that evaporates from it to try and remedy their hearing loss. Only a hearing person is going to come up with something like this. <laughs> So if this boiling urine remedy doesn't work out for you, I've got a recipe for an oil that is absolutely going to work. You might want to take this one down because I think that this is going to be a big seller. First thing you need is a live eel, a grey eel with a white belly. Now make sure you get the grey eel with the white belly. If it's a white eel with a grey belly, this whole thing is just going to go absolutely pear-shaped. So grey eel with a white belly. You need to put it into a pot, an earthenware pot, with a tight lid. The tight lid's important, okay, because the eel is still alive. Then you boil it under horse dung for two weeks. Okay, I'm not sure who has the time for this, but, and I'm trying to visualize how this is gonna work out. You know, your significant others coming home in the evening wondering, hmm, what's that for dinner that I can smell in the back? Anyway, if that, not that eel dung horse thing concoction that we're having again. Anyway, if that stew type mixture isn't to your taste, you might like to try the trend from the United States in the 30s and 40s for deaf flights. This was a horrendous idea from otherwise very smart hearing people, people like Charles Lindbergh, who would later go on to do the first solo transatlantic flight. Anyway, the idea here is you take the deaf person up on a flight to about 14,000 feet. And then this bit's important without warning, right? Because the deaf person just thinks that they're up with Uncle Charlie for a nice afternoon, a little flight, check out the scenes below. You go into a vertical nosedive, throw in a couple of loop-to-loops, and I don't know, hope that you just scare the deafness out of them. <laughs> Sadly, this trend, along with the earlier century ideas of oil boiling, eel horse dung concoctions, tended to kill rather than cure deaf people. 
Another proponent of some ridiculous ideas was Alexander Graham Bell, the telephone guy. So Bell was what we call a positive eugenicist. This means he wanted to try and breed out bad traits and breed in good traits. So one of his ideas in this regard was that we should publish a list of all of the men who had passed the medical fitness exam to get into the army so that women, when they were looking for a suitor, could get this sort of database of predefined good stock. Kind of like a Darwinian Tinder, if you will. <laughs> he could have been onto something with this one, I don't know. So he seems to have been really happy to try and help hearing people get set up, but not so much with deaf people. In fact, Bell actively campaigned that deaf people should not be allowed to marry other deaf people, lest they create a deaf variety of the human race. It's kind of hard to understand why Bell was so negative about deafness, though, because his mother was deaf, his wife was deaf, he knew sign language, but he didn't think that deaf people should use sign language. In fact, he thought that the most ideal school for a deaf child was a, chi a school where they never got to meet another deaf child ever. Obviously, the social repercussions of growing up thinking that you're the only person like you were completely lost on Bell. Anyway, some ridiculous ideas through the centuries, but fear not hearing people. There are a few people out there who can redeem us. There were a couple of good ones along the way. There was Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet. Gallaudet was charged with the task of traveling from America to Europe to come up with some of the strategies and methods for teaching deaf children so that they could come back and set up schools for the deaf in America. Now, Gallaudet didn't know anything about deafness. He didn't have sign language. So in his wisdom, he thought, I'll get a deaf teacher to come and help me with this. So he brought a French man called Laurent Clare from France back over to America. And between the two of them, they set up a host of schools along the East Coast. There was the wonderful William Stokey. So this was a bagpipe-wielding linguist who worked on Gallaudet University campus. So Gallaudet University is in Washington, DC. It's the only university in the world for deaf people, um, which, come to think of it, is probably the only socially acceptable place where you could play bagpipes at work is in a university for deaf people. <laughs> Um, and Stokey, in all seriousness, used to march around campus in full regalia with his bagpipes, which has now become one of my all-time life ambitions, so I'm, I'm putting that on my to-do list. So Stokey is credited with having gathered the evidence to prove that sign languages are linguistically full fluid languages in their own right. They've got their own syntax, their own structure. They're not just simple forms of gesture. There was the wonderful Mary Brennan from Scotland, who, even though she realised that BSL was a wonderful language, it was sort of limited when it came to talking about things like maths and science. I hope you enjoyed that. It was my one Maths Week reference for the entire <laughs> set. So Mary Brennan sat down with one of her deaf colleagues, a guy called Jerry Hughes, and they started in 2005 coming up with signs for technical terms. So they developed 80 signs that first year in British Sign Language for maths terms, but 15 years on, their glossary has expanded to 1,500 terms from topics like astronomy all the way through to geography. So the moral of the story is... Hearing people have a really atrocious tendency to terrible ideas when it comes to interfering with the lives of deaf people. But you can make an important contribution to this field if you're hearing, if you follow some simple rules and take the lead of those who have done things well in the past. So first, be like Gallaudet. Always assume that deaf people are going to know better what is best for deaf people and work alongside them as such. Secondly, be like Bill Stokey. Let the only hot air you blow be into a set of bagpipes. <laughs> Third, be like Mary Brennan, start small with a dedicated group of deaf people and you won't know how big that project might grow for you. And above all else, please, please resist the urge to try and cure deaf people, especially if it involves cruelty to animals or horse shit. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the sign for horse shit. <laughs> I've been Elizabeth Matthews. This was a terrible idea. Thank you, Brightly.